We're going to lose fast. U.S. Air Force held a war game that started with a Chinese biological attack. Hey there, this is Venominous. Welcome to the channel. So, let's begin here. Buckle up, buckaroos. Last fall, the U.S. Air Force simulated a conflict set more than a decade in the future that began with a Chinese biological weapon attack that swept through U.S. bases and warships in the Indo-Pacific region. Then a major Chinese military exercise was used as cover for the deployment of a massive invasion force. The simulation culminated with Chinese missile strikes raining down on U.S. bases and warships in the region in a lightning, air, and amphibious assault on the island of T um, Taiwan. The highly classified war game which has not been previously made public, took place less than a year after the coronavirus, reportedly originating in a Chinese market, spread to the crew of the USS Theodore Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier, taking one of the U.S. Navy's most significant assets out of commission. Then in September, in the midst of the war game, actual Chinese combat aircraft intentionally flew over the rarely crossed median line in the Taiwan Strait in the direction of Taipei an unprecedented 40 times and conducted simulated attacks on the island that Taiwan's premier called disturbing. Amid those provocations, China's Air Force released a video showing a bomber capable of carrying nuclear weapons carrying out a simulated attack on Anderson Air Force Base on the U.S. Pacific Island of Guam. The title of the Hollywood-like propaganda video was The God of War, H-6K Bomber Goes on the Attack. In the case, the new U.S. Uh, administration failed to get the intended message behind all the pro provocative military activity, Four days after President Biden took office, a large force of Chinese bombers and fighters flew past Taiwan and launched simulated missile attacks on the USS Roosevelt uh, carrier strike group as it was sailing in international waters in the South China Sea. Little wonder that many foreign affairs and national security experts believe the global pandemic has accelerated trends that were already pushing the United States and China toward a potential confrontation as the world's leading status quo and rising power, rising power, respectively. This month, the Council of Foreign Relations released a special report, The United States, China, and Taiwan, A Strategy to Prevent War, which it concluded that Taiwan is becoming the most dangerous flashpoint in the world for a possible war between the United States and China. In the Senate testimony on Tuesday, the head of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Phil Davidson warned that he believes China might try, sorry, might try and annex Taiwan in this decade. In fact, within the next six years. Meanwhile, the leading Chinese think tank recently described tensions in U.S.-China's relations as the world worst uh, since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. It has advised Communist Party leaders to prepare for war with the United States. What many Americans don't realize is that years of classified Pentagon war games strongly suggest that the U.S. military would lose that war. More than a decade ago, our war games indicated that the Chinese were doing a good job of investing in military capabilities that would make our preferred model of expedient... expedient ugh expeditionary war fair where we push forces forward and operate out of relatively safe bases and sanctuaries increasingly difficult air force lieutenant general s clinton high note deputy chief of staff for strategy into integration and requirements told yahoo news in an exclusive interview by 2018 the people's liberation army has fielded many of those forces in large numbers. To include ma massive arsenals of precision-guided surface-to-air and surface-to-surface missiles, a space base 
uh, constellation of navigation and targeting satellites and the largest navy in the world. At that point, the trend in our war games was not just that we were, we were losing, but we were losing faster, High Note said. After the 2018 war game, I distinctly remember one of our gurus of war gaming standing in front of the Air Force Secretary and Chief of Staff and telling them that we should never play this war game scenario of a Chinese attack on Taiwan again, because we know what is going to happen. The definitive answer is the U.S. military doesn't change course, or if the U.S. military doesn't change course, that we're going to lose fast. In that case, an American president would likely be presented with almost a fait accompli. A fait accompli. With Beijing continuing to tighten an iron grip on Hong Kong, engaging in deadly skirmishes with India along their shared border, and routinely bullying its smaller neighbors in the South China Sea, the Biden administration recently announced a new Pentagon task force to review U.S. defense policy toward China, to be headed to by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Inevitably, the deteriorating security of Taiwan will be a major focus on the new task force. By the way, three of China's standing war plans are built around a Taiwan scenario, High Note said. They're planning for this. Taiwan is what they think about all the time. In the early 2000s, China, China experts and military analysts at the RAND Corporation, corporations, Corporation were given a trove of U classified U.S. intelligence on Beijing's military plans and weapons programs and were asked to wargame a confrontation 10 years into the future. China was in the midst of an unprecedented economic growth spurt that saw its GDP increase annually by double digits, with consumerate uh, steep increases in its defense spending. Equally worrisome, the PLA had clearly studied U.S. military operations over the course of two wars against Iraq. Both operations relied on the method, uh, methodical, months-long buildup of forces to uncon uncon ah, sorry, uncontested bases in the region, followed by uh, U.S. aircraft dominating the skies and then carrying out devastating attacks on the enemy's command and control systems. China's answer was a well-funded strategy that the Pentagon refers to as anti-access area denial, A2AD, meaning it would prevent an adversary like the U.S. from being able to carry out the sort of significant military buildup in it carried uh, during the two Iraq wars. The PLA's military plans rely on space-based and airborne surveillance and reconnaissance platforms. Massive precision-guided missile air arsenals, submarines, militarized man-made islands in the South China Sea, and a host of conventional air and naval forces to hold U.S. and allied bases, ports, and warships in the region at risk because it lies only 90 miles from Taiwan. China needs only to hold U.S. forces at bay for a matter of weeks to achieve its strategic objective of capturing Taiwan. Whenever we war-gamed a Taiwan scenario over the years, our blue team routinely got its ass handed to it. <laughs> I can't believe I wrote that, got its ass handed to it. Because in that scenario, time is a uh, precious commodity and it plays to China's strength in terms of proximity and capabilities, said David Ockmanic, a senior RAND corporation, corporation analyst and former deputy assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Development. That kind of lopsided defeat is a visceral experience for, U for U.S. officers on the blue team, and as such, the war games have been a great conscious consciousness-raising device. But the U.S. military is still not keeping pace with Chinese advances. Uh, for that reason, I don't think we're much better off than a decade ago when we started taking the challenge more seriously.
part of the problem is that China advanced its AD2D, or sorry, aid. <laughs> said that word backwards. Uh, A2AD strategy, while the Pentagon was largely distracted fighting counterterrorism and counterinsurgency wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for two decades. Beijing is also laser focused on Taiwan and regional hegemony. While the U.S. military must protect power or project power and prepare for potential conflict scenarios all around the globe, giving the Pentagon what Achmanic calls an attention deficit disorder. Finally, there is the complacency of the perennial winner uh, that makes it hard for senior U.S. military officers to believe that another nation would dare to take them on. My response is that China's growing military confidence is manifesting itself in an increasingly belligerent approach to its neighbors. The growing frequency of the PLA's violation of the airspace, Taiwan and Japan, and the bullying of other neighbors in the South China Sea, said Hedmonic, under Xi Jinping, I don't know how to say his name, there have uh, been a dramatic increase in such provocations compared to a decade ago, and I think it's grounded in its belief that military China, militarily China is strong enough now to credibly challenge us. By 2017, the Pentagon, led by uh, then-Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, started to take notice. Developing the national defense strategy in 2017, the trend lines looked very bad vis-a-vis -vis China and got a lot worse as you pro projected into the future, said Elbrid Elbridge Colby, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development. Yet despite that fact that there were, and I still think are, a lot of people who resisted the idea that war with China is even possible, let alone losable, that's why both strategic level and more operational war games were more so, were so important. They help show how these things are possible, but also how we can redress the problem. It's just going to keep going. Holy crap. It's actually not that much longer. Where was I? It's longer now that I've lost my place. Mm -hmm. 2018, the Defense Department issued a seminal national defense strategy identifying great power competition with China, Russia, and not terrorism as the primary challenge to the U.S. After the lopsided blue team defeat in the Air Force's annual war game in the 2018, senior officers and defense officials began giving a classified overmatch brief to select members of Congress. And there's an old guy with giant ears, Jim Mattis. In most recent war games, or war game, the Pentagon tested the impact of potential capability, capabilities and military concepts that were still on the drawing board in many cases. The blue team, which represented where U.S. forces adopted more defensive and dispersed posture, less reliant on large, Vulnerable bases, ports, aircraft carriers, and the conflict with the red team, which represented China. Okay, like, I'm a little annoyed. The headline mentioned a bioweapon attack, but uh, I've read all this and there's no mention of it. It's like, this is very disappointing. I just want to catch my attention. I only read uh, the first quarter of the article before I went live here. I gathered a bunch of links, so we're going to go through those. So yeah, they just like wanted to capture my attention, and they totally did with that biological attack, and then they didn't even write anything about it. Super annoyed. I'm very annoyed by this. Alright, so let's move on. The whole China-US war thing is very much just a narrative they spin. I don't believe that they're actually enemies whatsoever honestly. Uh, and I'll show you how this has been a very common, uh, pretty much the, the main narrative, not the main narrative, but a big narrative in the whole mm, endemic. <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. I don't want to say anything to do with it. I don't want to get the video taken down because of stupid YouTube. So yes, they are controlling my language. 
But um, this is one of the articles I wrote. This is actually the first one I wrote about, you know what? And uh, yeah, there's some interesting things here. Like the whole, the whole narrative that you know what was started in a certain laboratory in China. That's actually a mainstream narrative. Mainstream conspiracy, I'd say. This is uh, Tom Cotton. He's a senator. And he was, um, I believe he was one of the, one of the guys in the Senate was uh, pushing that conspiracy as well. He uh, mentioned, it's actually, I believe I heard his video or saw that video of him talking and that's what first took me off to that um, second uh, bio, uh, what do you call it, viral lab. The second one that's actually very close to the Wuhan market. So yes, this uh, this market that's only uh, was it? I don't know if it says here. I think it's like twelve miles away from the market or whatever. It was designed. You I'm, you're probably well aware it's a lab designed for these types of viruses, deadly viruses. And I'm just like glancing at my notes here. Oh yeah. They claimed that the virus had the SARS virus had escaped multiple times from a lab in Beijing. Anyways, I think there's more on here. And then you had um, you had uh, predictive programming. This was a Netflix documentary that uh, we became aware of at the beginning of the whole event. Uh, this was the Netflix documentary that called The Next Pandemic or whatever. Actually, this is the other one because there's two of them. This one was a part of a TV series, like a, this was one of the episodes on this one, The Next Pandemic, was a Netflix documentary, it was like a TV, a little series had uh, several episodes, and The Next Pandemic was one of those episodes, and it talks about a Chinese wet market in Wuhan being the source for the outbreak, and then there was that movie, Pandemic. I don't think, I don't remember if the origin had to do with the wet market, but it was also, it says also coronavirus. And then we had that Montreal, uh, it, was a, it was a TV series that also started around the same time. And it also, like it was a... I don't think it was a coronavirus, but it was a epidemic in Montreal specifically. Then you've got the Wuhan laboratory, laboratory that resembles the Umbrella Corporation, and we'll get into the whole zombie apocalypse thing in a little bit. Strikingly similar. And this was a video by Jeff, and I think... Or is a TMF? Whoever it was, the video was gone, so that's off my page now. And is there more Chinese programming here? I'm not sure. Oh yeah, this uh, This was a simulation uh, that was 65 million people killed in the pandemic. Eric Toner here, the top scientist, John Hopkins. Uh, I think this is the same one as the Event 201. Uh, yeah, 
that's the same one, the Ventura one. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because that's also China centric. So that's the end of that. I also wanted to show China's aggression measures. And uh, uh, so my point here is that they're trying, they're trying to act like there's this big war narrative between the two countries. At the same time, we also have things that show that there's like um buddy buddy kind of situation here so we have aggressive health uh the one i wanted but anyways we'll just glaze over this one this is a uh, chinese aggressive measures have slowed the coronavirus this was uh back in march of 2020 we were talking about how the lockdown had shut down everything or had stopped the virus in its tracks kind of thing and Basically, the who is kissing its ass, China's ass over it, and, you know, the... This isn't the one specifically, or where the hell did that, heck did that one go? Here, I'll find it real quick. Oh my goodness, where am I? What? That was very weird, sorry about that. That didn't make any sense. Nope. Okay, I had it. Oh, come on. Oh, this is the one. The Guardian. This was... February. Coronavirus could infect 60,000... Or, sorry, 60% of global population if unchecked. The coronavirus epidemic... Oh, hold on a sec. Exclusive public health epidemic... Ep blah, blah, blah. I'm all over the place here. Epidemiologists say, says other countries should consider adopting China-style containment measures. That was the whole thing I wanted to show for that. Mm. It's getting late, so forgive me. A uh, coronavirus epidemic could spread to about two-thirds of the world's population if not con cannot, cannot be controlled. And then this pops up. Fantastic. Go away. I want to reject your stupid stuff. Get out of here. Uh, according to Hong Kong's leading public health epidemiologist, his warning came after the head of World Health Organization said recent cases of coronavirus patients who had never visited China could be the tip of the iceberg. Professional... Gabriel Luang, Luang, the chair of public health medicine at Hong Kong University, said the overriding question was to figure out the size and shape of the iceberg. Most experts thought that each person infected would go on to transmit the virus to 2.5 other people. That gave an attack rate of 68%. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, where's the part? He will tell the WHO meeting that the main issue is the scale of the growing worldwide epidemic, and the second priority is to find out whether the drastic measures taken by China to prevent the spread have worked, because if so, other countries should think about being like China, basically. Yeah, so. This one talks all about how great China is, and how maybe we should do what China does. There was also this story about the Canadians. I don't think I want to play the video. It's alarming. It's frightening. Stop it. So, Canadian scientists sent deadly viruses to Wuhan lab once before RCMP asked to investigate. So, remember that whole story with the smuggling of the... Scientists, this is known. What else... I can't turn off the volume on this tablet. It's so stupid. Uh... So just that guy mostly talking. 
I didn't get a chance to look at this. But it had Suspicious. the headline. It had the it's right alarming. headline. It's fright. Anyways, you get you remember that story, I'm sure. The guy, the scientist, he's brought the viruses to the the very laboratory that they uh, were working on coronavirus. So that's uh, that whole narrative there. Let's go to another article of mine. My part two, and it jumped right down to the bottom. Fantastic. So part two is all about um, fake news and stuff, basically. What's acceptable and what's not acceptable and all that stuff. Misinformation. Talked a lot about the other companies. Talked about Plague Inc. Oh, and this interesting game that came out at the same around the same time was uh, about not for broadcast. Take control of the nas na national nightly news as the radical government comes to power. This is an immersive, high-pressure propaganda sim. You control what the people see and determine what's not for broadcast. And that's uh, basically that was my influence for that whole post, the title at least. Yeah, so. But there was some stuff in here that was um, good to point out. Everything refreshes, so I lose my spots. Oh, that's where I found my article. Nope. Interesting enough, this is where I first, uh, when I was doing my research, I figured out the the cycle, the the the, way, the how they timed the event was right for China specifically was right during their the beginning of their flu season which was December that's when the event happened and it ends on March that's their typical flu season so and that's when um when they uh, took got control and they had zero cases like right on March 1st it was ridiculous so I know I have more stuff in here you know, 5G CDC guy that's not what I wanted to show no This just talks about YouTube censoring us. There's more Event 201 stuff. Okay, no, that wasn't... No, I don't want to do that one yet. Part 3 had some stuff in it, too. This one... Oh, yeah, lots of stuff in this one. So part three is important. Part three was about the infodemic, I believe. Right? Yeah. Infodemic stuff. Ah, uh, yeah. So we have the National Post. This is the National Post. Cave full of bats in China identified a source of virus almost identical to the one killing hundreds today. It's 15 years ago. They had located... A secret cave you're not allowed to know about, and yada, yada, yada. They had a rich gene pool of SARS-related coronaviruses, wildlife, blah, blah, blah. 96% similar to the novel coronavirus. What we're, what we're saying is that this cluster of viruses is a high risk, some douche douchebag said. And then... Jump to here. Coronavirus may have actually started in secret Wuhan lab. Just 280 meters. Oh, it's only 280 meters from wet market. A journal highlighted the close link of bats and the coronavirus-like pathogens after researchers were attacked by bats in secret labs. <laughs> There's a funny part here. So... Yeah, while well, the Chinese government said this outbreak started inside a wet market in Wuhan, scientists from South China University of Technology in Guangzhou said the possible origin of the virus 
Could be from Wuhan Center of Disease. Scholars Batao, Zhao, and Li Zhao published a research journal titled The Possible Origins of 20, 2019 and Co-Coronavirus. Remember what it was called that? Those were the days. On the research gate where they claimed WC... DC hosted animals and laboratories research purposes, including 605 bats captured in Hubei, Hubei and Zhangjiang provinces. So, yeah. And then the report mentioned one researcher known as J.H. Tian once, was once attacked by bats that, and that the blood of bat, of bat was on his skin. Tiang quarantined himself for a total of 28 days after bats peed on him. <laughs> I had to put that in the article. That was freaking great. But yeah, that was a mainstream article pushing that conspiracy. Why are mainstream articles allowed to push conspiracy? I don't know. But the whole, I thought, thought it was funny that it was mentioned after 28 days. So here's your 28 days later programming right there. Um... The lab is located 280 meters from the infamous wet market and adjacent to the Union Hospital where the first group of doctors were in, was infected. It read, It is plausible that the virus leaked around some of them contaminating the initial patients in this epidemic, though solid proofs are needed in future study. A secondary, second laboratory located approximately 12 kilometers. So that was, that was the other one. Was mentioned in the report, as it said, this laboratory repo reported that the Chinese horseshoe bats were natural reservoirs for the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, coronavirus, and yeah, so on and so forth. Then, uh, for the record, they still have not located the source of, you know, where that thing or originated, the the, you know what, so yeah, whatever, conspiracies. Uh, this is just um, the Trump era is a golden age of conspiracies. This is more mainstream articles talk about conspiracy stuff. And... Oh, yeah, this was great. Uh, what is this? The World Health Organization is urging tech companies to take tougher actions to battle fake news on the coronavirus. And this Andrew Patterson, digital business solutions manager for the WHO, said false information was spreading faster than the virus. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because the endemic, uh, the, the, uh, whatever they're called, the people who made Plague Inc., endemic creations who uh, came up with the game plan, Plague Inc., if, had a, if, oh, I didn't realize it was 17. Oh, that's great. Their uh, update to their game, Evolve Mutation 17. The fake news update has arrived. Deceive the world. So in the radically different fake news scenario, players can create their very own fake news story and deceive the world using modern tools and psychological tricks. From wild conspiracy theories to election campaign mudslinging, we now live in a post-fact world where falsehoods and misinformation spread like a disease. Just like a deadly pandemic, the spread of misinformation is a huge threat to society. So, yeah, spread like a disease. This guy said spreading faster than the virus. It's just so, so laughable. And, yeah, I repeat myself here because it's all important. But then, uh, more predictive programming. We have this guy named Bill Ryan. From Project Avalon character, he's uh, accurately predicting that China China would catch a cold. I don't necessarily trust this guy. He throws the 666 up at one point. It could just be a habit thing, but you never know. And he talks about how there was a secret round table with these people talking about a plan to have a cold virus hit China and it would specifically target Asians and stuff like that which uh, that didn't happen but it was interesting enough the whole China narrative then we had Sylvia Brown uh, predicting uh, said virus 
in the round 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking attacking lungs in the and the bronchial tubes and resisting known treatments almost more than uh, more baffling than the illness itself will be the fact that it will suddenly vanish as quickly as it arrived, attack again 10 years later, and then disappear completely. And I don't know about that. But I have, I have thoughts, but I can't say them in the video. I would uh, have to share them on a platform that allows free speech. And then we have the Dean Coots Eyes of Darkness, you all familiar with, which has the same Chinese scientist, similar name, Li Chen, Chen, it's very similar. And they call the stuff Wuhan 400 because it was developed at their RDNA labs outside of the city of Wuhan, and it was the 400th viable strain of man-made microorganisms created at the Wuhan, or research center, Wuhan 400. But, uh, that's not actually the original. The original was actually Gorky 400. Uh, Gorky 400 can't survive outside a living human body for more than a minute, which means it can't permanently contaminate objects or entire places uh, the way anthrax or other vir vir virulent bacteria can and when its host expires, the Gorky foreigner within him perishes a short while later. As soon as the temperature of the corpse drops below 86 degrees, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but Elliot knew what the scientists meant. If I understood you, the Russians could use Gorky 400 to wipe out a city or a country, and there wouldn't be any need for them to conduct a tricky and expensive decant decontamination oh my goodness before they moved in and took over the conquered territory and whatever uh, I think it's actually more interesting that uh, it actually a newer version got changed to the Wuhan thing I think that's even more telling than act like you would think oh um, most people would think obvious like oh they just uh it would focus on the fact that it wasn't actually originally that, but what it means is that they've updated it for the for for the plan. You know what I mean? Change of plans. It's going to be China, kind of thing. Uh, what else? I think. Uh, no, that's oh. No. I don't think there was any more. China stuff. There's more Tom Cotton. Cotton repeats coronavirus conspiracy theory despite evidence. And prominent political figures in the nation's capital seem a little too fond of conspiracy theories. Folks like Donald Trump and Senator Rand Paul routinely seem to embrace some rather nutty explanations for events with more rational explanations. And... Regular readers may recall it was six years ago when the far right... Arkansas told voters that Islamic State militants may travel to North America, partners with Mexican drug cartels, cross the border, plot terrorist strikes, and target his landlocked state. Press for some kind of evidence caught in reference to peace from an unhinged conspiracy theory website. And well, yada, yada, yada. The right, however, doesn't want to do anything of the... Wait, what? Anything of the kind... Uh, as the New York Times reported, former Chief White House strategist Stephen, Stephen Bannon, or is it Stephen Bannon, appears fond of the idea as it's gained traction among conservative media outlets, and now the public is hearing it again, except this time it's coming from an ambitious senator who happens to sit on the Senate Intelligence Committee reinforcing concerns about the blurred line between the Republican fringe and Republican mainstream. And scientists strongly condemn rumors and conspiracy theories about origin. I mean, they condemn it and they spread it. They condemn it, spread it, whatever. Next. That's right. Uh, using lessons from past outbreaks to fight coronavirus. Is that an actual video? No. Mm.
Oh yeah, this was interesting. One of the most important lessons in any public situation is, is communicate. She said, people crave information, and if the CDC isn't providing it, someone else will. So yes, get on that propaganda, because people crave it. Uh, another interesting thing. Uh, event 201. The players. This guy, George Gao. George Fu Gao. Professor F George F. Gao is the Director General, Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, a professor in the Institute of Microbiology, Chinese Academy of Sciences, President of the Chinese Society and of Biotechnology, and President of the Asian Federation of Biotechnology. Dr. Gao obtained his DPhil degree from Oxford University, UK, and did his postdoc work in both Oxford University and Harvard University with a brief stay in Calgary University. His research interests include enveloped viruses and molecular immunology. Immuno, immunology. His group research is mainly focused on the enveloped virus entry and release, and especially influenza virus interspecies transmission, host jump, structure-based drug design, and structural immun immunology. He is also interested in virus ecology, especially the relationship between influenza virus and migratory birds or live poultry markets, and the bat-derived virus uh, ecology and molecular biology. Dr. Gao has published more than 450 reference papers and 10 books or book chapters, and he has applied for and obtained more than 25 UK, US, and Chinese patents. His research has recently expanded to public health policy and global health strategy. He led the China CDC team from September to November 2014 to work in Sierra Leone in the fight against Ebola. So he's part of the Ebola pan a scamdemic. Oops, I mean, real event. Sorry, YouTube, I, I don't know what happened to me. There was a, a slip of the tongue. I didn't mean to say that. It was, I, I was taking my pills. I don't take pills. Dr. Yao is a member, academian of the Chinese Academy of Science, Sciences, a fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, also known as the World Academy of Sciences. Oh my God, shut up with this sciences. A fellow of the Academy... American Academy of Microbiology and an associate member of the EMBO. He is a recipient of several national and international awards, including the Twas Twat <laughs> Medical Prize 2012, the Nikkei Asian Prize 2014, and yeah, he's he's awesome. He's awesome, guys. But yeah, CDC China was part of Event 201. <laughs> yeah, so... Mm. And there's one more I wanted to show. Okay, so you might remember this. Scenarios for the future of technology and international development. Scenario one. Lockstep. Although I really recommend reading all these scenarios because all of them play their part. They all have... All of them are happening. And that's, I find that's very common with all these things, is that they'll often have like, you know, four scenarios or more, and it's not ever just one completely. It's always a mixture of them all. So lockstep was a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009 H1N1, this new influenza strain, originating from wild geese, was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic-prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million just in 7 months. The majority of the healthy people or healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economics, international mobility of both people and go goods. Gods. Goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism and breaking global supply chains. Uh, even locally, normally bustling, bustling shops and office 
buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employee, employees and customers. Pandemic blanketed the planet, though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official contaminant protocols. But even in developed countries, contain, containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discu discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency, accelerating the spread of the virus not just within the U.S., but across borders. However, a few countries did fare, fare better, China in particular. The Chinese government quick, Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near hermetic sealing off of all borders, saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of the virus far earlier than in other countries and enabling a swifter post-pandemic recovery. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect the citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions for mandatory wearing of face masks through body temperature checks and the entry to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their Activities stuck and even intensified in order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global, increasingly. Sorry, I'm just hearing something. Anyways, uh, that's messed me up. Where is my? Where am I? Intensified. In order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly. Increasingly global problems from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crisis or crises and rising poverty, leading leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. First, the nation, or sorry, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternal mist paternal paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight, and national leaders had more latitude to impose order in the ways they saw fit. In developed countries, this heightened oversight took many forms. Biometric IDs for all citizens, for example, and tighter regulations of key industries. Oh, jeez. Stop that. Key Industries. No! <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whose stability was deemed vital to national interests in many developed countries enforced cooperation with a suit of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily restored both order and, importantly, economic growth. Across the developing world, however, the story was different and much more variable. Top-down authority took different forms in different countries, hinging largely on the capacity, caliber, caliber, and intentions of their leaders. In countries with strong and thoughtful leaders, citizens' overall economic status and quality of life increased. In India, for example, air quality drastically improved after 2016 when the government outlawed high-emitting vehicles in Guana. Uh, the introduction of ambitious government programs to improve basic infrastructure and ensure the availability of clean water for all her people led to a sharp decline in waterborne diseases, but more authoritarian leadership worked less well, and in some cases, tragically, in, some con in countries run by irresponsible elites who use their increased power to pursue their own interests at the expense of their citizens, there were other downsides, as the rise of vir virulent nationalism created new hazards. Spectators at the 2018 World Cup, for example, wore bulletproof vests that supported the patch of their national flag. Strong technology regulations stifled innovation, kept costs high, and curbed adoption. In a d developing world, access to approved technologies increased, but beyond that remained limited. The locus of technology innovation was largely in the developed world, leaving many developing countries in the re receiving end of technologies that others considered best for them.
Uh, some governments found this patronizing and refused to distribute computers and other technologies that they scoffed at as secondhand. Meanwhile, developing countries with more resources and better capacity began to innovate internally to fill these gaps on their own. Meanwhile, in the developed world, the presence of so many top-down rules and norms greatly inhibited entrepreneurial activity. Scientists and innovators were often told by governments what research lines to pursue and were guided mostly towards projects that would make money, e.g. market-driven product development or were, uh, were sure bets, e.g. fundamental research, leaving more risky or innovative research areas largely untapped. Well-off countries and monopolistic companies with big research and development budgets still made significant advances, but the IP behind their breakthroughs remained locked behind strict national or corporate protection. Russia and India imposed stringent domestic standards for supervising and certifying encryption-related products in their supplies category that is rel reality, uh, reality meant a reality meant. Sorry. Uh, all e IT innovations, the U.S. and EU struck back with uh, retaliatory national standards, throwing a wrench in the development and diffusion of technology globally, especially in the developing world. Acting in one's national self-interest often meant seeking practical alliances that fit with those. Uh, I think I'll stop there. You get the point. Let me just glance at this, see if it's a, anything I should mention. Oh, in 2025, people seem to be growing wary of so much top-down control and letting leaders and authorities make choices for them. Whenever national interests clashed with individual interests, there was conflict. Sporadic pushback became increasingly organized and coordinated <clears throat> as disinfected youth and people who had seen their status and opportunities slip away, largely in developing countries incited civil unrest in 2026. Protesters in Nigeria brought down the government, fed up with the entrenched cronyism and corruption. Even those who linked, liked the greater stability and predictability of this world began to grow uncomfortable and constrained by so many tight rules and by the strictness of national boundaries. The fleeing lingered I'm sorry, the feeling lingered that sooner or later something would inevitably upset the neat order that the world's governments had worked so hard to establish. Yeah. Here's a great quote. It is possible to discipline and control some societies for some time, but not the whole world all the time. G.B. Bat, Taru, Leading Edge, India. And yes, that is so true. They can only hold us down for so long. Um, I better wrap this up soon. Okay, we'll clock this at an hour tops. Just hold on a second. We gotta get out of this thing. So just remember the I referenced the Umbrella Corporation and the similarities there in the logo. <clears throat> There's the one. It came out recently in the news. It was actually a rehashing of uh, when the CDC came out with its zombie preparedness propaganda. I believe it was from 2011. Yeah. <clears throat> preparedness 101 Zombie Apocalypse, May 16th of 2011. They've recently bought it back up in the news. This is from two days ago. How to Survive a Zombie Apocalypse According to the CDC Inside Edition. If there was a zombie invasion, would you know what to do? No worries. If the answer was no because the C Center for Disease Control has got you covered with their preparedness 101 zombie apocalypse. As their website states, emergency can happen at any moment in any... Every community in the U.S. must be ready to respond. A pandemic, natural disaster, or chemical or radiological release often strikes without warning. 
costs both economic and human can be dear. The organization has put out a zombie preparedness sheet that is chock full of information on how to prepare for the zombie apocalypse. For one, they have a zombie preparedness blog people can refer to for tips. The zombie preparedness for educators, complete with lesson plans and activities. A zombie preparedness poster, so it's always top of mind. And a zombie graphic novel that follows two characters and their dog as a strange new disease surfaces and spreads, turning ordinary people into zombies. The lesson here goes back to the importance of being prepared so that readers can get their family, workplace, or schools ready for before disaster strikes, even though the thought of zombie attack may be scary or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Emergency kits. Uh, so, yeah. Why are they bringing this back up in the news all of a sudden? That's the question here. What's going to happen? That they're going to... they got to refresh our minds on. <laughs> Sorry, fly just flew in my face. Um... I don't know, but uh, do you know what day it is tomorrow? It's going to be March 11th. 311, baby. Is there something crazy going to be happen? Would it be having something to do with this or something completely different? Um, it's the anniversary of the event being declared a you know what. So maybe something crazy will happen. Maybe it won't even have anything to do with this. Not that I think zombies are going to be a thing. There might be something that will make people look horrible or whatever, and they will call them zombies. We're pretty much already plagued with zombies if you think about the people on their devices all the time. But... Uh, yeah, something might, something might crazy might happen tomorrow. So I don't know why are they bringing this up, and why did that first article mention a biological attack and not give any information about a biological attack? just says in the beginning, biological weapon attack that swept through the bases. But it just, it left it very, you know, unsatisfactory. Anyways, I am just about to add an hour, so I will start wrapping this up. Yeah, so, um, the whole war narrative, I don't buy it as a natural thing like a I very much believe it's all part of a larger plan I think that um, let's get a search oh I just had it and then it's gone I believe if um, there is fighting it will be short. It will be a brief war. Um, uh, hold on. Uh, what am I? Sorry, I'm a little distracted. So China's been um just sucking up all of the U.S.'s soy crops like crazy. They've been buying everything up. You think um if these countries weren't getting along, why would you be giving them so much of your crops? In fact, they've been they bought so much they bought next year's crop. That's how much uh China's uh sucking up food from the U.S. The U.S. Just, just keeps giving it to them. I guess, you know, because they want to shrink their own farmlands down anyway, so what do they care? 
But I mean, at the same time, why would you help out your enemy? They're always helping out the enemy. It doesn't make any sense. Anyways, I need to wrap it up. We're at an hour. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble. I hope I was able to paint some sort of picture there to show that it's all just a big play. And there's definitely more I could say about it, but I really can't go any longer because uh, I did a video last night, which was over an hour and a half. And uh, yeah, it took forever to upload on this thing because I'm using the tablet to screen share and it sucks up data like crazy. So with that said, I thank you so much for your time and attention. I will got my fingers crossed that nothing happens tomorrow. Nothing crazy. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there. This has been Amis reporting from the Brave New World.